What is perhaps also uh, very interesting is the more interactive period that is now going to take place, questions and answers. So please feel free to raise your hands. I will collect a, a number of questions and, and then uh, go into a, a second round as well. I see one, two, three, four. That will be later on. Uh, good afternoon, Joanna Dyduch from Wrocław University, Poland. Uh, I'm wondering um, about the, well, I would like to ask, uh, talking about the future of uh, European defense cooperation, European defense policy, uh, we should first define common interest in the field of defense. Uh, and in my opinion, it is always uh, connected with the threat can we identify today common threat for all 28 European Union member states? And to what extent the uh, United States can be involved in combating this threat? Thank you very much. We have uh, Magrit. Margaret, the mic is oh, coming. Excuse me. <coughs> Jolie mentioned that uh, CSDP NATO division of labor is, is not credible. Um, but I wondered what, uh, what kind of um, intensified cooperation uh, you identify with that. So how does, what, that, what does that look like, that intensified cooperation? Because I also sense that other speakers had uh, different opinions about CSDP NATO uh, cooperation. So perhaps that's something uh, you could uh, clarify a bit. Thank you. And there are also questions over there. Yeah. Okay. Very good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sneha. I am an intern with the uh, United Nations University. And um, I must say, coming to this panel was such an easy choice because this topic is so important. Um, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Howarth a couple of questions. Uh, he spoke about uh, handing over, uh, I mean, a sort of handover of the NATO to Europe uh, on behalf of uh, America. But I was wondering about, you know, the entire foundation of NATO because uh, U.S. was so instrumental in sort of forwarding its interests because it was so concerned about having uh, its reputation in foreign policy and having a certain weight in uh, what Europe decides. And considering that that may not be a priority now is probably far from uh, being true because even now it is so important for uh, for American foreign policy. And you spoke about realism and uh, power maximization, but then again, uh, in terms of American security interests, also to a great extent being forwarded by its ideology. The reason why it even uh, participated in the Balkan issue was not uh, so much a question of its security as it was about its reputation and its weightage in uh, you know, the security of Europe. Uh, you also uh, referred to the pivot to Asia, but currently, I mean, I don't think American relations with uh, its Asian counterparts have been worse than it is now in terms of, uh, you know, the cyber espionage uh, accusations, in terms of its, uh, its statement against China on the dispute over the islands. So, I mean, it's, it's mo more about the talk about the pivot to Asia, but there's no credible uh, steps. Probably this is the start. But then, of course, U.S. is distracted and weighed down by the current concerns in uh, global insecurity. And lastly, in terms of um, sorry, in terms of hegemony within the NATO, I think for uh, European states, they would rather prefer the hegemon to be far away across the Atlantic rather than have a neighbour like France or Britain that's calling the shots within the NATO, just in terms of uh, you know psychological impact. But that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I last the next uh, session you will be on. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Julia Morevska from the London School of Economics. Um, I have to say, as a Ukrainian, it's, um, these panels have uh, taken on an added interest. Uh, but uh, that is not my question. Um, my questions rather have to do with um, the whole goal of demand harmonization and harmonization of requirements. It seems that this need has been highlighted um, time and again, year after year. And I am wondering what stands in the way of that. And on the flip side, um, how do we get to uh, a situation where uh, member states are comfortable enough to harmonize their requirements, harmonize um, def uh, demand for defense equipment? Uh, this is related to the first question that was asked. Um, and if that means you know, uh, arriving at a shared um, level of ambition, then in parallel, what would that take and what would that involve? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I have four questions. Two are clearly addressed to Julian. There is this uh, element of harmonization, Madam, I uh, think uh, you will take. And then, uh, who is going to take the 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 the, the interest, uh, the, the the question of the, the common threat? Uh, can I invite you? And Sven, perhaps us as well. So we will start with this uh, question on the common threats. First, the general, then uh, Sven. Uh, I will then come to you, Madam, for the harmonization. And uh, the, the two other questions for you, Julian. Can there be a shared level of ambition? Yes, it exists in NATO. It exists in the EU. It exists in every member state. But it exists easily in every member state. It's much more complicated within the EU and within NATO. It's a cumbersome process, and it's all about getting down to the bottom line that everyone can agree, which makes documents not as interesting as those that are provided by each individual member state. You have member states who pinpoint threats by names, countries. You have countries who pinpoint organization, like Russia does with NATO. But uh, there is a need. Chief of Defense within Europe, as highlighted uh, through other discussions, and as I witness uh, chairing their committee, the committee, they need some elements, some guidance in order to prepare for the future. If they don't have the guidance, yes, they can't pull and share. They'll pull and share in groups, in entities, based on their national requirements, not on the common requirement. So there is a need for a vision. And that vision, and, and this is, uh, I'm stating the obvious, because this is known by everyone, and it has been highlighted in the conclusions of the European Council. So yes, in the conclusion of the European Council, the next high representative is to come by uh, June 2015, which with an analysis of the threats and challenges and with a vision as to uh, how we should address those. It will be of great importance because we need to know <coughs> what type of scope we plan to do within the EU and in what region, what areas and with which uh, partners. So uh, there has been one, as you know, but which is outdated now. It's not sufficient. It needs to be uh, more uh, clarified uh, for this. Uh, so, so much for the uh, shared level of emission. I'd like to touch upon the harmonization of demands. You can't harmonize uh, demands. This is not possible because the way that uh, each one of our member states uh, is engaged is different. Some are geographically in different positions, some are organized differently, some of our member states have conscripts, others don't have conscripts, some are ready to go to far operations in adverse conditions, and some are not. Some are uh, ready to have uh, forces that are very well protect only, and some are ready to have it differently. Some are ready to engage on their own in high-intensity warfare, whilst others know or are not eager to do that and do it with others. So harmonization of demand is very complicated. But, and I'm sure Claude François Arnoux will highlight, that there are forums, and the European Defence Agency is a fantastic forum for that, to bring people closer together, to share ideas, to share uh, plans to allow for that plan to come at the same moment. If they have a diversity of planning of five years, well, how about making it at the same time? With the idea not to have the same product. You don't have the same car as this person or that person. Everyone needs a different car. But you need to be able to go to the same gas station and you need to be able to go and operate in the same uh, environment. You need to be able to stop at uh, traffic lights and the rest. It's the same for us. We, the military, we need to be able to operate when our governments tell us to operate together in a good manner. 
And we need also to be able, and this is what about EU, and I'll stop there, it's about solidarity. So it's about sharing assets and having the ability to maintain an equipment that belongs to another nation with uh, parts that come from another nation without having a legal issue if an event occurs. So this is, this is what is, it is about harmonization. And it is also about harmonization of, of mindset. How are we going to do a mission, an operation, in five or ten years from now with an armed drone? How are we going to operate this? Are we collectively at 28 sharing the same idea as to who is going to press on the button? Well, this is harmonization. It's not about having the same uh, looking equipment. It's about operating. Okay, thank you. On, on, on the interests again, I think Im implicitly there is probably a stronger idea of what our shared interests are and where are the key threats and challenges against them, and that's what ought to be the areas of focus for our security and defense. And Ashton voiced them very clearly in her report to prepare last December's European Council. She said, one, we need strategic autonomy. That I read to mean we need to be able to do things without the Americans if necessary. Two, that starts in our own broad neighborhood, including, she, she writes, the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, to which I would probably add the Gulf region. Three, she writes, in that area we need to protect our interests. Four, uh, by projecting power. You know, power projection, definitely a new word in the EU vocabulary. Uh, five, we need to do that with local partners where we can, but if necessary, alone. That gives you a very frank statement of what, you know, what should be our focus. Linked to that, the decision that uh, next month we will adopt a European a maritime security strategy that gives you an important second uh, priority. And I would personally add a third one, which is we need to do our bit for the United Nations. If we go to the Central African Republic, I don't think it's mainly uh, out of some really specific interest. It's a more humanitarian um, concern. I, I thought that was a very, that could have been a very neat expression of you know, why Europeans need the military instrument. So before the European Council, I went, I told everybody in Brussels who wanted to listen, two or three people, um, um, all the European Council should do is copy and paste. You know, you can make one really neat, sharp paragraph that could be very clear, could give very clear political guidance. Um, in a way, as Varompa has said, or what had hoped it to be, not to the CSDP, but to European defense, regardless of, of, of the form. But then it didn't happen, and all we got was the rather vague mandate to the next, um, uh, to the next high representative. And if you would have that, from that I think you could then, uh, through the military committee, through the shots, um, you could from that deduct your uh, quantifiable military level of ambition. Officially, the target is still the headline goal. Deploy 60,000 troops. Actually, we do that, you know. For the last decade or, or more, usually more than 60,000 Europeans are deployed on operations on a permanent basis. But we couldn't do much more, you know. If, if tomorrow we would decide that we do need to deploy an army corps in Ukraine or Syria, I'm not advocating that, but let's assume, where would it come from? So I would say, starting from that political level of ambition, I would say a real level of ambition worthy of Europe would be a double headline goal, meaning to read the headline goal um, to mean you need to be able to deploy that core over and above your ongoing operation so that actually you have a real strategic reserve as Europeans. And I know that sounds really, really fanciful when I, when I say that. It's easily said or written. But given that we still pay 1.5 million people to wear uniform, you know, then, then the twice 60,000 with the rotation, of course, is, is not that fanciful or ought not to be that fanciful. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. And uh, on the review of the security strategy, from my experience, I know if it's vague enough in European declarations, it usually gives results. <laughs> if it is too clear, it stays too clear without results. So the hope is justified. On the, on the other element, we have harmonization of the way we operate, and there is a harmonization of procurement uh, 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 of assets as well. Could you, uh, uh, Madam, answer the question that has been raised in, in this field? Thank you. Merci, Général. 
Uh, yes, I think that prep there is a, sometimes kind of different meanings to harmonization of requirement. To come to harmonization of requirement stricto sensu, that is, well, uh, for, the, for the equipment, um, I agree with uh, General de Rousier that it's not something that we should look at for 28 or 27, Denmark is not part of EGA, member states. Uh, but for small groups, and I really believe that harmonization of requirement is absolutely vital uh, within small groups, and EDA is absolutely fit for allowing two, three member states to work together on uh, programs that they want to develop to, to answer to a capability shortfall they, are, they have. And I really think that well, it has not happened very much in the past. Even within a single member state, you don't have harmonization of requirements. You have different munitions, you have different even plane, whether it is for the Navy or for the Air Force. Or for, I will not say that in front of Patrick. But even within member states, it, it, it's difficult. And of course, it's more difficult at the level of the European Union. Difficult in a small group, because again, everybody wants uh, his own specification at his moment and what is largely hidden between that is also sometimes to serve its national industry or even its local industry at regional level, sub-regional level uh, within, a, within a state. Then uh, I, I nevertheless think that we are in such a difficult situation, in such a kind of emergency that we absolutely need this harmonization of requirement. And now you have industry asking for it. Because in the past, well, they could be very happy with dozens of programs, dozens of versions. Now they systematically, anytime you listen to a CEO, he asks for harmonization of requirement. And what uh, General Quelmont and Sven have developed have a kind of architect. In a way, it's largely what, for instance, but he is not the only one, far from it, Tom Enders from Airbus, is asking permanently, empower EDA, empower EDA for God. We need uh, harmonization of requirement <coughs> and discipline throughout the life of a program because even if you harmonize initially, uh, then you have uh, during the life of a program at all the different <coughs> moments of updates, retrofit, you have different versions coming. The worst, the, generally the, the example that is always mentioned is a number of versions for a helicopter. Uh, NH90, but it's not the only one, and then we have systematically that program. On top of that, you have to add the question of calendar, that the member states not only don't want the same version, but they don't want it at the same moment. And then, that's why I think there is such merit on uh, the ideas that have been uh, proposed by uh, Egmont Institute, uh, by, by Spain and, and by you, uh, is to have an architect, uh, and, uh, and also to find solutions, uh, including financial solutions, to address the fact that the member states are never ready at the same time. And they don't get their money at the same time. And as Ben said, in sometimes they even, uh, their money is wasted, is lost, because the program is not ready uh, for the, uh, the, finance, the funds to be um, used during the fiscal uh, year. And it's points that are really very important. And now I think that, again, the situation in our member states for the military staff, for the uh, procurement agency is so difficult that it will happen. And I think that EDA offers the possibility. Then it's a different issue than the issue of interoperability. It's part, but, but a small part of the how to operate together. I think on top of that, we have a systematic systematically to look at the different uh, ways uh, of making all our system uh, more and more interoperable. It comes, it begins with standards, with tests, with certification processes, of course with mindset and particularly training and we are working in EDA on all those elements that enable the, the cooperation and the possibility to, to work together. If I may add something at a question that was not raised by the room, but by you, Sven, and you, you, about having the commission as a customer. Uh, I think it's a good way to put it, uh, because there was this very difficult debate about EU-owned capabilities, and then it becomes a, a big uh, uh, political or you know, <coughs> theological issue. Uh, 
if you take what we try to do vis-à-vis -vis the satellite communication, uh, we firstly we have already developed in EGA um, pool procurement for uh, a service of uh, communication. And of course, if uh, in a civilian mission, but also uh, the commission for Frontex or for other of the agreed competencies and mission, not going beyond the present competencies, but agreed competencies of uh, the community of uh, the European Union managed by the commission, of course, if they need that satellite communication, if Frontex uh, needs drones or to, uh, for emergencies or for surveillance of the forest for the environment, I don't think that there could be a problem. I think any problem would be a misunderstanding. That, that is really my, my feeling, and that, yes, uh, the Commission could be a customer, and it's what we try to do, uh, trying to identify the civilian needs, again, for satellite communication services. And I think it will be even easier when we address the issue of services, rather than to have a specific capabilities, planes, but service. And if you take, for instance, transport, uh, air transport, you could very well have the Commission using an air transport service uh, that would be offered by uh, the military uh, for an emergency, for, uh, how do you say, pont aérien? Uh, air airlift? Air, air bridge. Uh, air bridge uh, in case of an emergency, and I think it would be beautiful politically if we could, when we send some uh, humanitarian assistance, also show that uh, behind that, there is uh, different nations coming together with, uh, with EU. And that can have also a very strong uh, external policy impact. When you have a disaster somewhere, if you can show, including through the way that the air bridge would be conducted, that it's Europe coming together, and it makes sense. And I'm very for, no, no, I think you made a lapsus. It would not be the 11th customer. But, but, <laughs> but one additional customer uh, on top of the member states. I think it's a proper way to put it. If I may very quickly. This already exists, of course. Uh, there is al already this interaction. I think the, the real topic is the one uh, and that was highlighted uh, during in the Commission's uh, presentation, which is about owned EU assets, owned by the Commission and by member states to operate in certain areas. And there, there are member states of the European Union who are profoundly against this. But there's a way out. And the way out is what is happening with the uh, firefighting aircraft, mm -hmm. where the, uh, of course, it is needed everywhere. And the Commission funds with money and has uh, the ability to take drawing rights. drawing rights. And so this could be applied also to drones because currently no nation is ready, well, there are many nations, sorry, <coughs> who are not ready to see the European Union possess on its own this capacity. But there is a need to change uh, habits and change mindset, and there are uh, ways to do that. Thank you, thank you very much. Julian, you had still some questions addressed to you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a long story, a long answer, so I'd be very, very brief. Uh, second edition, my second edition of my book is now out. <laughs> All the you answers get 20 are in there. 20% off by taking one of these leaflets, so they're right there. Um, and I, in the end of chapter four, I answer Marguerite's question at some length: about how we, how we uh, sort of envisage this, you know, harmonisation of, uh, or rather, intensive cooperation between EU and uh, and, CS, and uh, CSDP and NATO. I mean, Without going into too much, in, into any detail, all of this is predicated on a number of assumptions about the way in which the United States is moving. And this answers the other question um, from um, our friend from the United Nations University. Um, you know, I repeat that the, the US has been driving European, sec European security autonomy for a very long time, since long before San Malo. And San Malo was a response to American requests for the Europeans to get their act together. And when we talk about the Balkans, this was another, this was the first worm in the apple. I mean, the Americans could not understand why they should be involved in Bosnia-Herzegovina at all, and did not like to be involved, didn't want to be involved, were very unhappy with the result, and are very unhappy with the result in Kosovo. This demand is, is, is coming thick and fast all the time. 
why Margaret's just left, so I'll answer her uh, question about uh, the inadequacy of the division of labor. CS, try to think back about why CSDP came into existence at all. We had NATO, we had the WEU. It came into existence because of the dysfunctionality of those two agencies to achieve the sorts of things that the Europeans were wanting to do. And they didn't want to do, sorry Patrick, they didn't want to do just soft stuff, just security sector reform or border management or anything like that. Yes, your EU is doing Atalanta as well. It does a range of things, but its image is the softer side, the easier side. And what does NATO do? Well, NATO does obviously Kosovo, it does Libya, it does Afghanistan. Uh, with the greatest regret in the world, I have to say that I don't think history will record that any one of those three is a, su a success story. They've all three caused enormous problems rather than solved problems. So if NATO is just Article 5, and this goes back to our Polish friend's question about what is the US involvement, if NATO is simply Article 5, it's a is it a nuclear deterrent? Is it an American armed division deterrent? I don't think so. Obama ruled that out on day one of the Ukraine crisis, and I haven't heard anybody in the United States say that the United States be prepared to fight a war when over Ukraine. So uh, what, what, what is, Wait, it's unsatisfactory for the United States to have a division of labor, and it's unsatisfactory for the Europeans to have that division of labor, which is why the logic is to try to make these things uh, work together. Just one final word about the US-Asia, uh, the pivot to Asia. I mean, it's, yes, it's true. You, if you say that you think relations have never been as bad, that is probably true. And the United States is experiencing right now the extreme complexity of pivoting to Asia because it is awakening expectations in places like Vietnam and the Philippines and whatnot who want the American umbilical cord against the Chinese much more than Uncle Sam is prepared to provide that umbilical cord. So they're really caught in a tremendous contradiction there. Japan, America is on a knife edge between saying too much in one direction, which will give the Japanese the wrong idea about how far the Americans are prepared to go over the Senkaku, for instance. And in the other direction, they will push Japan to go nuclear, which is the last thing they want. And that was the purpose of Hegel's visit to Japan at the beginning of the Ukraine crisis. Please don't get us wrong. We are committed to Senkaku. Don't go nuclear. It's an almost impossible trick to pull off. And you're absolutely right. It's in, in very bad shape right now. OK. I know there are still two questions. But I think, let's say, uh, we will give you this uh, privilege during the coffee break. What I would like to do uh, now is, first of all, uh, congratulate all of you uh, for the interest you shown, for the, uh, uh, the, 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 the questions put forward. But also, what I would like uh, to ask you is to give an applause to the, to the, uh, uh, the panel members. I think we had a very interesting uh, afternoon. Thank you very much.